Hey, thank you so much for blessing us with time together, time in your word, time with one another. We pray, Lord, that our study today would be anointed. We would learn. We would learn about you. We would learn about your call in our lives. We would learn about the church in Philippi. We would learn about chapter one. And we would learn how it makes any difference in our lives today. We ask your blessing on our study of the word, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, welcome all. Last week we, we introduced our study of Philippians. A little bit about, remember what Philippians is? Philippians is an epistle from the Apostle Paul that was written by Paul, most likely between the years 60 and 62, when he was in prison in Rome. And so, it, you know, it, it, it's, never, it's never an exact science trying to sort of date and fit the precise things. What we look at is we look at a timeline between the book of Acts and the other letters that he wrote and information in the letter itself to try to get a sense of, oh, this is when this would have happened. Okay? And so it, it's, a, it's a reasonable guess. It's helpful for us then because I don't know about you. <clears throat> Is there a difference between the letter that you might write when, I don't know, you're sitting in Santa Barbara having a Mai Tai? <laughs> and when you're in, in a hole, right, getting fed a bucket of water, having to use the restroom in another bucket in the corner in Rome? Is there a difference maybe in the letter and how you might want to write the letter and read the letter, right? Doesn't that affect us? So... The reason why we even look at the background and all that is because of things like that. It, it, it is useful to get a better sense of where someone's coming from when you look at the letter. And, and in no way does that affect this being God's word written, right? It's all about God's word written. God has chosen to make use of the Apostle Paul, breathed in his ear, inspired him to write this letter to the church in Philippi for a reason. Right? God didn't dictate it on stone tablets that they found out in the wilderness in Philippi. There's a, there's a human being that wrote it, inspired by God, anointed by God. And so where he's coming from and what's happening, it makes a difference. It's also helpful to know that the Apostle Paul has a relationship with the church in Philippi. This isn't a letter that's written to strangers. So if you think, for example, about the epistle of James. Right? The epistle of James is a, is a letter written... We believe by James, the brother of Jesus, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, that was broadly intended for pretty much every Christian in the world, but especially the Christians that lived in what was then called Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. Likewise, First and Second Peter, right? Broad audience. There's people that Peter had never met. The overwhelming majority of people who would have received James and received First and Second Peter, had no relationship with Peter, had no relationship with James, had never met them, knew who they were, but didn't know them. With Philippians, it's different. The church in Philippi exists. Remember, this is looking back at Acts chapter 16, because the Apostle Paul and his team are ministering in Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and they're in the north of Turkey, and they're considering sort of where they're going to go next. Where's the Lord leading them to go? They're being spirit-led. And in a dream, God gives Paul a vision. And we refer to the vision as the vision of the Macedonian man. This is what it tells us in Acts 16. And in this dream, Macedonian man says to Paul, come and help me. Come and help me. And so what happens? The apostle Paul wakes up and he tells us, guys, we have a message from God. God's told us we're going to go to Europe. They didn't call it Europe then, right? But he said, we're, we're called to go to Macedon. It's the first time the gospel has left Asia, right? Because remember, you know, Jerusalem is in Asia, right? Turkey, Asia Minor, is in Asia. It's a, it's a curious region in Asia, but it's not Africa. It's Asia. And it's called them to travel now to Europe for the first time. And so they cross over into Europe. It's the first time that the gospel is shared among Europeans, if you will. How many of y'all, how many of y'all, you know, your DNA, your history is somehow connected to Europe? Anybody? Anyone here? Anyone at all? Right? So you think this is, the, this is the story of how the gospel gets to Europeans. Right? The, 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 the Lord speaks through a dream to the Apostle Paul while he's in what is now Turkey and says, Come to tell us about Jesus. Remember who the Macedonians were. 
So often we think about Alexander the Great as Greek, right? Although technically, remember, he's not Greek. He's Macedonian. It's like, imagine a thousand years from now, people looking at the Canadians and calling Canadians Americans. Would that be accurate? Now, is there a lot in common? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know. Can you imagine that Vancouver could potentially be uh, in Washington State instead of Seattle? Can, can you see that that could happen? I can. I've been to Vancouver. Can you imagine that you know, there's some other cities? So, for example, Calgary. I mean, Calgary could be in Texas. Have you been to Calgary? I mean, Calgary, you know, most people, when they, people that don't live here, when they think of Texas, what they're really thinking about is Wyoming or Calgary. Right? It is a cowboy town. It is pickups. It is oil and gas. It is rough riders. It is all in. Right? Except in the winter, it's just crazy cold. Right? So there's definitely a degree to which you can think about parts of Canada. You think, ah, it's, it's kind of American. Except it's not American, is it? Their currency has a picture of the queen on it. How about yours? If, is Elizabeth on your dollar? No. Right? If our dollar is the anti-Elizabeth. The guy on our dollar is the guy that fought the war to defeat Elizabeth's ancestors in war, right? 300 years ago. So likewise, Greece and Macedonia are not the same place. What happens in history is Greece has this era, era of heroes. It's amazing. The ideas of democracy and all that. They found those city-states. Corinth, Athens, Sparta, all these little city-states. Greece is not a united country. So what happens is over time... Just north of Greece, in Macedonia, there is a guy that becomes the king. His name is Philip. And Philip sort of consolidates power, builds a pretty strong military machine. And guess what? He invades Greece. And he picks him up one little city-state at a time. And he's very successful. He's much stronger than the Greek city-states are. And then he dies. Philip dies. Guess who his son is? Alexander. Alexander the Great from Macedon. Conquers the rest of Greece and then just keeps going. Conquers all of Turkey, conquers North Africa, including Egypt, conquers the Middle East, conquers Iran, conquers modern Iraq, conquers modern Afghanistan, conquers most of modern Pakistan. Alexander the Great does that. He's not Greek, he's Macedonian. So when you think about Philippi, Philippi is a Macedonian city. It's got that history. It's got that history of being a kind of a tough, rugged, all-in, blue-collar military town that now is under Roman occupation because it's been a long time since the heyday of Alexander the Great. By the time this letter is written, it's been 350 years. So now the big kids on the block are the Romans. And when the Romans come and they take Philippi, which is named, by the way, after whom? Alexander the Great's daddy, Philip of Macedon. So when the Romans come and they conquer it, they think, you know what? This could be a tricky place. It's on the edge of the empire. Right? It's kind of, it's, it's, it's way, it's a long ways from Rome when you get to Macedon. You think, man, this, you know, these, these people, they're pretty tough. They've got a history. They're pretty proud. How do we make sure that this isn't a problem for us? We don't have to continue to send soldiers. Let's just, let's just turn over the gene pool. That's what they do. So they, they create special incentives for Roman, you know, retired Roman legionnaires members of the Roman military, when they retire after 20 years of service, if they survive, they can move to Philippi basically for free. If you move to Philippi, right, if, and you're a Roman soldier, you're now a citizen, but guess what? It's tax-free. No property taxes for life. So if somebody told you, I'll tell you what, you move to Santa Fe, no property taxes for life. Y'all looking at property? You're going to Verbo? You're, you're looking at sort of what, you know? Are you with me? That's what they do. The Romans are genius. So what happens in Philippi? All these retired military guys, where do they all go? They go to Philippi. So Philippi turns over, becomes really a Roman town. It's way, way far away from Rome. But it becomes really a Roman town because they've incentivized Roman soldiers moving there. So it's not just a Roman town. It's what kind of a Roman town? gritty. It's tough. It's filled with retired soldiers. Right? What kind of men are those? Roman soldiers. 
Remember what Roman soldiers were? Roman soldiers didn't keep the peace. They made the peace. Roman soldiers invaded all these different places. Remember, Rome is pretty small. It's just a little city. Roman soldiers kept going on behalf of the emperor and conquering and stealing. That's what they did. Romans didn't come and make friends. Romans never put on blue hats and said, we're the peacekeepers. Romans came and took stuff. That's what they did. And so the men that ran the legions, those guys are tough. Those guys are mean, right? Those guys get stuff done. And those are the people that live in Philippi. So when, when the Lord calls Paul to go to Philippi to share the gospel, he's calling him to go to a pretty tough place. Blue collar, rough around the edges. It's a very pro-emperor, pro-Roman town. You know how many Jews live in Philippi? Maybe none. Very few. We know from the story of Acts chapter 16 that when Paul does get to Philippi, which is a city in Macedonia, there's no synagogue. Remember, normally when he goes to a town, we see this in the book of Acts, he goes first to the synagogue, and he preaches the gospel, and then he goes to the Agora, which is like their mall, the marketplace, and preaches the gospel so that there's this ministry to the Jews, and then there's this ministry to the Gentiles. He didn't go to a synagogue. Why? Presumably because there isn't one. If there's no synagogue, it likely tells us what there's few, if any, Jews that live in Macedonia, and certainly in Philippi. So this is a Gentile town. What else do we know about the religion there? We know that it's not a place that does goddess worship. It's not a place where they have Mithras and all this. You know, all over the Roman Empire, there's sort of polytheism. There's all these different religions, right? The official religion, though, of the Roman Empire at this time in history is emperor worship. And so basically what they say is you can worship Aphrodite for all we care. As long as you go to the temple to the emperor a couple times a year, you're registered there, you pay your, you pay your tithe, we're going to leave you alone. We're going to leave you alone. And so you have places all over Asia Minor where the dominant religion is, is goddess worship. That's Ephesus. Remember that story? That's why Paul gets in trouble there. Because of the big temple of you know Diana... All these people come to faith. They stop going to worship the goddess because they're, they're renouncing paganism and they're following Christ. Next thing you know, the business of buying statues to the goddess drops off the cliff. This is what happens in Ephesus. And the people whose job are you know, the merchants of making the statues for Diana, they go to the local town council and say, the economy's getting wrecked because of these Christians. Do something about it. Next thing you know, they're attacking Paul and running him out of town. Well, is there a, is there a goddess worship cult in uh, uh, Philippi? No. None that we know of. The religion there is emperor worship. You know what the title was when they had the worship services? We know because the Romans kept great records. You know what they referred to in the worship services at the temple to the emperor in the first century? They referred to the emperor as the what? As the soldier, right? And the kyrios, as the Lord and Savior. Those were the titles that they had for the emperor. The emperor, not a Lord, not a Savior, the Lord and Savior. And the worship service for the emperor cult, which would have been in Philippi, would have been everywhere. He is referred to as the Lord and Savior, whether it's Nero, whether it's Tiberius, before that, whether it's Augustus. He is the Lord and Savior. So what is the claim of Christianity? Jesus Christ is whom? Lord. The Lord, the Savior. Do you see how that would be a problem? If there's a definite article, that means that there can only be what? One. If it's a Lord, well, you know, we've got a lot of lords. If it's the Lord, there's only one. And so if you go into a town that's filled with retired Roman soldiers. The dominant religion there is emperor worship, right? And you're now telling those people that the Lord and Savior is not the emperor, it's Christ Jesus. Do you think you might have some trouble? Absolutely. So as we get into taking a look at Philippians, he doesn't spell out in detail what the persecution that they're facing is in Philippi, but it's not difficult to figure out what it would be because we know what happened all over the Roman Empire between the 1st and the 3rd century. The reason why the persecutions came against Christians was precisely this issue. 
was Christians refusing to go and worship the emperor as the Lord and Savior. They said, as a matter of conscience, I can't do that. Right? I bend the knee to Christ. Right? So I, I cannot say those words. They'd say, say those words or we're going to cut off your hand. Can't do it. Chop. Say those words or we're going to impale your children. Can't do it. So when you think about the, the, the persecution, we talk about the, the early church persecution, the presenting issue that caused that persecution was the refusal of believers to bow down, bend the knee to the emperor and refer to him as Lord and Savior. They weren't revolutionaries. They weren't raising up militias. They weren't confronting the state. They were paying their taxes. They just said, that's something we can't do as a matter of conscience. And as a consequence, they were persecuted heavily. That was true everywhere. In what kind of a town, though, would that persecution be the worst? How about a town that's filled with Roman soldiers, whose god is what? The gladium, which is their short sword, and the emperor. I mean, they, they traveled all over the world. Working for whom? For him. For the emperor. Who pays them? The emperor. The, the entitlement that they have, the reason that they live in Philippi in the first place, why is that? The emperor. He's incentivized them. I mean, their whole world is revolved around serving the emperor and being what? Blessed by the emperor. Given gifts by the emperor. Being paid by the emperor. They feed their families based on the emperor. So of all the places for there to be a church that sort of says, mm, Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior, the hardest place where you're going to be confronted with a community that's going to say that's wrong is going to be a town that's all about the emperor. And that is Philippi. So Paul goes there. He doesn't find what? He doesn't find a synagogue. Instead, he finds a group of women who are meeting outside the city walls in, in a little prayer circle. They're referred to as God-fearers. Right? And we know what that looks like also historically because they're not the first ones that are mentioned in the Bible. In fact, in the temple, when the Lord you know, inspired the temple to be built, the temple in Jerusalem, remember there's a special courtyard. There's a special courtyard in the temple in Jerusalem called the Court of the Gentiles. That court exists for people that are not Jews, but believe that the God of Abraham is the true God to go and pray. They're not circumcised, or they're women whose husbands or dads are not Jews, and therefore they're not Jewish. But that's where they can go to pray. Remember the story in the New Testament of Jesus when he goes ballistic and throws over the tables and drives out the money changers? Where does that happen? Court of the Gentiles in the temple. Why does he get so upset? Because that's the one place where people like us, who might not be Jews, but we would come to know that the God of Abraham is a true God, will go to pray. That's where we can go to pray, because we're not going to go to the temple of Dinah. We're going to go there. But now we couldn't pray because it's filled with what? With animals and money changers. That's why Jesus loses his mind. So fast forward all these years later to Philippi. There's no court of the Gentiles because there's no temple in Philippi. So these women have just found a quiet place, literally, outside of town. It tells us in Acts 16 that when they go to this place to pray, where are they? The yeah, they're, they're, they're beside a river. They leave town. Remember, this is, a, this is a time in history where towns would be fortified. There are literal walls around the towns. Literal walls. And there are literal gates. And there are guards at the gates at night. And there's people that man the gates to make sure that what bandits don't come in and do harm. And they locked the gates at night, and that's what they did. And so these women have left the town walls, gone outside of town to a little place by a river near town, and they found a quiet little spot where they can, they can pray in peace. Because they're not praying to the emperor, they're praying to the Lord God of Abraham. The apostle Paul seeks them out, finds them, and says the Lord God of Abraham became incarnate, lived among us, taught us how to live, died for our sins on the cross, and conquered death. His name is Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you all about him. And he leads all these women to faith. They're all baptized. The leadership of this church from day one is a group of women. And it's not just women, women, right? It's, it's, it's leading women. We have the name, right? Acts 16 tells us the name of the woman that started the church. Remember her name? Lydia. Lydia. What is her job? What does she do? What's her business? Yeah, she's in textiles. She's in textiles. Purple what? Purple garments. Purple cloth. She makes purple cloth, which would be like, you know, the Gucci of the day. Right? 
She's, you know, she's like, she's like the, the leader of the Gucci in Macedonia. Pretty good business to be in. So that's who she is. And she's got a group of other women, her whole household, they're all baptized. The other people that constitute this church in Philippi are whom? Who's the next group that we hear about? People that were where? In prison. Because what happens? Remember the Apostle Paul has started this church with Lydia and her household and these friends by the river. And we don't know what kind of growth they're having numerically, but something is going on. He's living in, in Philippi. He's ministering to them. He's growing this church personally. He's in the middle of it. And one day, you remember this story from Acts. This is still chapter 16. They're walking by and there's this demon-possessed slave girl who starts to yell, saying, Look at you! You know, purveyor of the gospel. You serve the one true God. Da, 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 da. And it's the demon inside this girl that's calling out. And the Apostle Paul basically says, Stop talking. Leave us alone. He's annoyed by her. The thing about this girl is this it's just a poor slave girl. But because she's demon possessed, she's got some gifts for fortune telling. And her owners are using this slave girl who's demon possessed as a profit center. They're making money off of her. Right? And so what happens? Finally, it's a hilarious story, actually. They've had enough of listening to this demon inside this girl kind of harangue them every day while they're walking around town. So Paul turns to her and commands the demon to come out of her. He exercises the demon from the slave girl. The demon comes out. The girl is delivered. You'd think, wow, great story. Great for her. But her owners, who use her to make money, are what? They're incensed. It's like the scene, it's like the same scene in Ephesus where the guys whose business is selling statues of Diana are incensed because people aren't buying their statues anymore because they're following Christ instead of worshiping the goddess. Now, instead of being in Asia, now you're in Europe, and the issue here is these guys whose business is making money off this fortune-telling, demon-possessed girl, now, guess what? She can't tell fortunes anymore. And so they go to the local leaders, and they say, these Jews from out of town are making trouble. Are making trouble. And what do they do? What kind of town is this in Philippi? Roman town. Military town. They don't waste any time. They grab Paul, these, out, these Jewish outsiders. They grab him. It says they beat him in Philippi. I mean, they give him a beating. And you think a beating from those kind of men is going to be easy? Imagine these are 50-year-old retired military soldiers. Are they going to go easy on Paul and Timothy? They're going to work him over. And they do that and they throw him in jail and they're like, ah, let's see what happens next. They could have killed them. And, and Paul's there in jail with Timothy and while they're there in that jail cell, what do they do? Are they sitting in the corner crying? No. They start to preach. They start to teach. They start to sing hymns to Jesus. Next thing you know, the other prisoners are like, what? And the other prisoners are listening and Paul and Timothy are ministering to the guys in prison. All worked up, I'm sure they got bloody faces, they got black eyes, but here they are, praising the Lord, teaching and preaching, an earthquake happens that night. And there's some kind of a breach in the jail, so that some of the walls come down, so that the prisoners in the jail could literally, what? Skadoodle. But what happens? They don't. They stay in the jail. They continue to be in that jail and listening to Paul and listening to Timothy teach and preach and praise. The jailer comes running up, realizing there's an earthquake, the jail might be compromised. He thinks, I'm in trouble. He shows up. Nobody's left. And he's sort of overcome. And he says, what happened? And then Paul and Timothy do what? They lead him to Jesus. So think about the DNA of this church in Philippi that's receiving this letter. Is it a Jewish church? No. It's a Gentile church. It's composed initially of a, of a leading woman and her household and friends and sort of circle. And the second group is the people that were just happened to be in jail with Paul and Timothy on that night when they were in there and the earthquake came. And then the jailer. So you think again about DNA. If you think, boy, I want to start a strong, vital, vibrant church. You think, let's go to the prison. Let's start it there. Is that what the Episcopal Church would normally do? Is that what Green Acres would normally do? No. And yet that's what God does. And this church becomes something really special. And so you think about all the letters of Paul, consistently when we hear these letters, sometime in the first chapter or two, Paul goes from saying, I love you, you're wonderful, but 
right? And then he chews on them. He challenges them. He rebukes them, either because there's something theological that's wrong, Colossians, right? Galatians. Or there's something in their behavior that's wrong, like the Corinthians. Either there's bad doctrine or there's immorality. Pretty much in every letter that Paul writes to every church, there's something going on. Except the Philippians. There's no rebuke in Philippians. Philippians don't get rebuked for their sin. They don't get rebuked for what? For bad, for heresy. They're just encouraged and loved and supported. So it just says a lot of great things about a church, doesn't it? This is the church that you would think has every disadvantage on the surface, right? It's not started by these leading Jewish men at all. It's not started by the elites in the community at all. Instead, it's started by a group of Gentile women and prisoners. And yet, this is the one of all the churches that's the one that's praised, that's affirmed, that's encouraged. It's amazing. I love this letter. We're going to have so much fun studying together. Let's take a look today. Let's read through this first chapter, and then we'll take a deep dive into the first 11 verses. Tina, you want to kick us off? We'll do a couple verses at a time. If you don't want to read, just tell the person to your left, and we'll just keep on going. Okay? Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of the partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this work that he who began a good work in me will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. First time, Pamela. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more, and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That I with you understand, brother, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out right unto me unto the uh, furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all places, in all paths, and in all places. Verse 14, Lynn. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more than courageous, more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. Karen? The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or truth, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, I can in spiritual labor for me. Yes, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, but that is far better. Laurel? But it is more uh, necessary for you, you that I may remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, 
so that whether I come and see you or in absence, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, mm. with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, the mere salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Verse 30. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So it begins with sort of the address. It's, it's in, one, in one way very typical address, the first couple verses of chapter 1. But in one particular way, it is unique, right? So when Paul writes a letter, pretty much overwhelmingly, he identifies himself from the very beginning. It's the form of writing letters in the first century. I wonder, you think about our grandchildren, what kind of letter writing skills are they going to have? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, think just, I mean, practically. So there's, there's, some, there's some skills that have been passed down, and they've changed over time. The way I was taught to write a letter would be different than the way my great-grandmother would have written letters. But still, there was sort of a pattern. I mean, I was taught letter writing in school. My kids haven't been taught letter writing. Because the main way that my children communicate, if it's not verbal, is what? Text. Yes. Think about that. Think about that text messaging. And then all the platforms that are used, and I don't use them. I've even been off Facebook for a year and a half now. I just they just wore me out. I just can't do it. I just you know, and it's, it's, there's tragedy there. Sometimes people post things that I wish I knew, and somebody will say, "Did you see this?" I'll say, "No, I didn't." You know, but it just it wears me out. But practically, though, people are communicating through all these other things. So all that's to say that letter writing in the first century had a format, just like the letter writing that we would have learned as kids had a format. And for them, generally, Paul follows that format. Here's what's different in this letter. It's the only letter of Paul that's written clearly from both Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ. It's the only one. There are some letters where, where other people other than Paul are mentioned in the address, but it's like Paul, the apostle of Christ, and Timothy. Right? Because remember, Timothy functions as his assistant, as his disciple, as his protege, and as his personal secretary. His executive secretary. Most of the time it's Timothy or Titus that actually has a pen in hand. And he's putting this down on parchment or vellum or whatever they're using to write. Remember they don't have paper like we do. So it's not pen to paper. But it's some, whatever the product that they would have been using to record the letter down. It would be Timothy or Titus or one of the others. Paul doesn't write himself the letter until sometimes the very end. And you'll know that because he says what? I write this in my own hand. It's like sometimes in a letter, he'll, he'll go out of his way to sort of say, what I just basically took the pen to emphasize the point. This is Paul. So usually, Timothy is just taking dictation. In this case, though, the letter comes from both. Maybe that tells us something about the nature of the ministry that they had in Philippi that we just can't know because it's not recorded in Acts. But it, it, is, it is a curious thing that Paul and Timothy are writing this Together, As what? Servants of Christ. It says something about the nature of Timothy's ministry in Philippi as well. That perhaps his ministry was as vital and as fruitful and as impactful as Paul's was. That he wasn't just sort of back here in the corner following behind Paul, but was deployed and had an impactful ministry. And so he's mentioned as Timothy speaking as well. And look what they call themselves. Servants of Christ. The word servant, remember, is the word doulos which sometimes is translated slaves. The most accurate translation of doulos is bond servant, meaning, you know, I'm, I'm bound. I'm bound to this one. I'm more than just a worker. It's not like, you know, I can take another job and leave, but also it's not a slave. Like we think of slavery because of our own history with slavery as a country. It's not that either. So it's like, it's like I'm bound to him with this deep bond, but I'm also under his authority. 
I'm not an equal. I'm not a colleague of Christ. I'm what? I submit to Him. I bend the knee to Him. He is my Lord. You know? But, I'm, but I do that willingly. I remember, we think about slavery. We think about unwilling slaves, right? So a bond slave is somebody who says, sign me up. I have bound myself to this person. So he's Paul and Timothy, bond slaves of Christ Jesus to all the, all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. We see this a lot. Remember, the word saints means holy ones. Saint is synonymous with holy. The word saint means holy ones by definition. It's exactly the same word. Sometimes it's translated differently. That's what it means. The holy ones. The holy people. To be holy doesn't mean that they're perfect. It means that they've been set apart by God for God. That's what it means to be holy. The holy Bible, the holy church, set apart by God for God. The, the people of God are referred to as saints. Even if sometimes you look in the mirror and think, I'm not feeling very saintly today. God still says, no, you're mine. You've been set apart by me for me. You are a saint. Those who are at Philippi, curious thing, with the what and the what? Overseers. So in the, in the Greek, remember this letter is written in Greek. With the episkopoi on the diakonoi. That's what it says. With the overseers and the deacons. The word for overseer is a word that also in a Catholic Bible, it's translated what? Bishop. Bishop. Bishops. Bishops. Because the word episkopoi is the word that we translate bishop. Does that mean something different to us sitting in this room? Episkopos? Than it does to somebody that's at Grace Community Church? Maybe. Because our church is named after it. <laughs> it's an order, uh, it's, it's a way of organizing the church. And a, a bishop, an episkopoi, by definition, is an overseer. And it's not a churchy word. It's a word that's been used by the church, but it's a word that precedes the church. So in the first century in Philippi, if they had a work crew that's tasked to put a road together, the person that was the foreman would be called the what? The Episcopos. The Episcopos. If you have a business, I mean Lydia and her business. If she's got one person that sort of runs the floor in her shop, her textile shop, that person would be called the what? The Episcopos. The overseer. It's not a word that it's, whose origin means something at all to do with the church. It's a word that's about function. The person that oversees an organization, right? That's what the word episcopal, episcopos means by definition. So there's two ways we think about it when we see it here. One, it does tell us something about some of the, this church and a couple of other churches about how they were organized. That they had what? They had overseers and deacons. Right? They didn't just have presbyters or nothing but lay people that didn't have any differentiated role. No, they had very clearly differentiated role. People had a role to play. But before the Episcopalians here, we all get too excited thinking about, ah, Philippians is an Episcopal church. Well, the church in Philippi would have been a house church, right? 40, 50 people maybe? I mean, how many people can you fit in a house in the first century? Not super big, right? Growing, fruitful, but not super big. So, I mean, how many bishops do you need if you have 40 people in the church? I think, I mean, for me, if it's a bishop, one is too many. <laughs> Find some more, you know, make your way to New York. You know, it's, we don't really need any bishops if we got 40 people. You know, thank you so much. God bless you. We wish you well. Have a nice drive back to Houston. You know, I mean, really. <laughs> if there's 40 people, do you need a bishop? Right? So, so for us, and here the word, the word overseer is a singular or plural. There's more than one. There's more than one. So, you know, yes, two things we can glean from this. One, it is a reminder that one of the earliest models for church governance and organization involved the episcopoi, people that we would now call bishops. That's a fact. It's right here. It's undeniable. And this isn't the only church that was like that, right? Here at Philippians 1, verse 1, boom, there are bishops there. However, the overseers that they would have had would look extremely different 
from the bishops that show up at Christ Church and other Episcopal churches a couple times a year to do confirmations. Right? These are practical overseers. They oversee ministries. So here you would think of the person that oversees loaves and fishes, Episcopoi. The person that oversees the ushers, Episcopoi. Head of the altar guild, Episcopoi. Would you it's a shame that Cheryl's not here. She could hear that today. Pretty good. Yes, ma'am. Would you equate it to a vestry? No, not a vestry per se, because a vestry is really is an elder board. They would have had a different word for that. It's about a couple of individuals who oversee particular areas of ministry, right? So they don't. It's not a group that would call a rector or that look, looks at governance. It's not elders. That's a different word. This is about a task, just like you know, in your textile shop. Who's the person that runs the store? And a work crew. Who's the guy that's the overseer? Same idea. So there's, there are overseers and diaconoi and deacons in the church whose ministry is one of service. To all of them, he says what? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember this word grace? We know the word well, unmerited favor. Remember though the, what a big deal this title is for them? So the typical greeting for people on the streets of Philippi in the first century would have been Cherain. Cherain, which simply meant greetings. Cherain. Here, instead of saying Cherain, he says Cheris, which means grace, right? Sounds a lot alike, but it's a very different word, isn't it? To wish somebody what? The gracious favor of God, the love of God, the unmerited favor of God, that's what grace is. As opposed to just saying, howdy. Is there a difference? Absolutely. You know? So it's a beautiful greeting. He wishes them grace and peace. Peace comes from, remember, ultimately Hebrew, the word shalom, a typical Hebrew greeting, wishing somebody the peace of the Lord, from which we get our tradition and worship of saying what in the middle of the service? Peace, peace, peace. peace be with you, the peace of the Lord. That's where it comes from. Because that's the greeting that we, we hear again and again in the letters in the New Testament. And then he begins with what? Verse 3. Eucharistia. The word is Eucharistia. Thanksgiving. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you. Making my prayer with joy. But he's kind of, I mean, he's going, he's falling over himself. Saying positive, affirming, encouraging things to them. I mean, in a single sentence, he's basically said, you're amazing four different times. Right? He's grateful for them. He thanks God for them. He's praying for them. Filled with joy. Why? Verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He refers to them as what? Partners in the gospel. He, 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 he recognizes what their ministry is referred to them as saints. And now he's referred to them as partners. He's not talking about a hierarchical relationship with them. I'm so proud of you because you paid attention. You did what I told you to do. No. They're partners in the gospel. They're affirmed. They're encouraged. Because they live obviously a saintly life. I am sure of this. Verse 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Verse 6, when he talks about this good work, what, what might that mean? What is a good work? What good work was begun in them? Salvation. Yeah, their salvation. Coming to faith. But then what would follow is, right, the, the good work in them, which is becoming a Christian, is also being fruitful because it's exhibiting good works in them. The, the, the essential good work was becoming a Christian. But that good work is then giving evidence of itself by the good works and how they live, right? So there, there, sometimes we make this distinction between, you know, what does it mean to be righteous? And there's a debate. It's an old debate in the church. It's really, it, it's a false debate. That to be righteous means that you're saved. And some people say, no, to be righteous means to be good. They're both true. To be righteous by definition means to be saved, right? You're in Christ. You're made right with God. That's what it means. But to live righteously means what? To exhibit the fact that you're a believer by how you live. And we just sort of the dumbed down executive summary of that is to be good. To do good works, right? So do the works make you 
righteous? No, the works show that you are righteous. Right? So here, what does he say to them about this church? The good work that was begun in them is their salvation. They're being, being Christians. But it's what? It's continuing. And ultimately, his prayer is, he says, I am sure that he who began a good work in you, he who saved you, will bring it to completion at the day of Christ, will fulfill sort of the arc of your faith journey ultimately when Christ comes again in glory. That not only are they saved, but they're growing. They're growing in their faith. They're maturing as Christians. It's a beautiful image of, I think, the Christian life. Isn't that what we want for any of us? And for our kids and grandkids? That we come to faith and that we continue to grow in grace. That's what he's saying about them. And it's interesting, the completion he talks about is the day of Christ. We know this expression if we've studied the Bible. The day of Christ is a reference ultimately to the second coming of Christ, right? Sometimes you can think about there's a degree to which you're going to experience a mini day of Christ when you face the white throne judgment after you die, right? But ultimately, the day of Christ is his glorious second coming. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Just he heaps praise upon them but no, when he, even when he kind of in passing reference mentions the day of Christ you know, talking about the second coming of Christ to a community of people who have no background in Judaism remember? Because this idea of the day of Christ is, 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 a, is something that Paul makes intelligible to people by pointing them back to the Old Testament, especially Isaiah and Daniel, in which there's this teaching about the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. It's all over the Old Testament. And so if you're a Jewish person, you know what the day of the Lord is. You know that, what that looks like and what that means. And so when Paul comes and sort of says, the day of the Lord that you've been trained in as an observant Jew... Well, let me connect the dots with you between the day of the Lord in the Old Testament and Jesus. Okay. I mean, you're already halfway there. But if you're going to a church, literally that's not a church, a prayer circle by the river, and you, you go literally from worshiping the emperor in his temple to being in jail to being baptized, do you have that kind of theological background in the day of the Lord? No. Your theological background is pretty thin. So for him to sort of make a passing reference to them growing in their faith until the day of Christ, that means that when he was with them, they were, they were all in on faith formation. I mean, their faith formation in Philippi must have been robust. Because they, if they're already talking about the second coming of Jesus, and they, it wasn't that long ago that they were baptized, I mean, they have been really digging in to the Word of God, to the teaching of the Lord. Remember, because what other tools do they have? Do they have a New Testament in Philippi? No. No, the, the New Testament is being put together in all these letters everywhere. Maybe they had Mark. We think that probably the Gospel of Mark was written around the year 55 AD. So is it possible that the Gospel of Mark would have been, because they're all hand copied. There's a hand copied version of the Gospel of Mark that's made his way up to Macedonia for them to have, they can read in church and read about the stories of Jesus? Maybe. Maybe not. I mean, it's remarkable how spiritually mature and vital this church in Philippi already is. I think it's, it really is a great example of the fact that, you know, to, to, we should not have low expectations on people of faith. We should dream bigger dreams for them, Right? We should set a higher bar for ourselves and other people. We shouldn't think, oh, they're young, oh, they're ignorant, oh, they're not well-educated. I mean, goodness gracious, this church in Philippi, he just makes a passing reference to the second coming of Christ, assuming what? That they know exactly what he's talking about. It's amazing to me. I mean, trust me, I just, as a priest, if, if we did a sort of a, a, a poll of Episcopalians around the country and said, tell us three things about the day of Christ, what kind of great, what kind of, how do you think that would go? <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, it's amazing. I just, it, it, it's a marvel. To me, it's inspiring. It's inspiring. This church in Philippi, they are, wow. And he says, what? Of course I do. Verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you. Of course I, of course I'm excited about you. Of course you fill me with joy. Of course I'm proud of you. 
Because I hold you in my heart. We use that as an idiom, don't we? Don't we use the same idiom? If, if we say to somebody, I hold you in my heart, what are we saying? I love you. I love you. I mean, I can talk about people. She owns my heart, right? And there's two she's in my family that for whom that's true. I've got a wife and a daughter. I mean, holy cow. You know, they own my heart, right? For you're all partakers with me of grace. Again, this, this great word for them. There's no hierarchy in this letter that he's writing to them. He's affirming them. He's called them saints. He's called them you know, fellow ministers of the gospel. Now you're all partakers with me of grace. We're all in this together. We've all received the favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. Well, you, you're with me. He says, you, you've been standing with me the whole time, whether I was in jail, in Philippi, and maybe now in Rome, and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. So defense, if you're defending the gospel, what does that mean is happening? Why would you have to defend the gospel? You're, you're being attacked. So is it possible that we could, you know, there's no stories about it, but back in Philippi, there would have been some days where Paul would have been attacked for what he's doing and what he's teaching? Clearly so. And what did the church do when Paul was attacked? Paul and Timothy were attacked. They stood with him. They stood with him, right? In my imprisonment and defense of the God and confirmation of the gospel. Beautiful word. Verse 8, for God is my witness. It's a way of underlining. This is hyphenation, circling, asterisking. God is my witness. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I miss you so much. Right? I mean, how much more affection is there than the affection of Christ Jesus? Can you go beyond the affection of Christ? Yeah. But Christ plus one? I mean, there's nowhere to go from there. He's saying, with every ounce of my being, the biggest hyperbole I can give, that's how much I miss you and I just yearn for you. And verse 9, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. That your love would just continue to grow. With knowledge and all discernment. Interesting Choice of words, right? So he prays that their love is going to grow, but it's a love that's rooted in what? In knowledge and discernment. That means it's not it's not sentiment. He's not talking about a sentimental love. He's not saying so just so you feel even warmer. That's not it. It's a love that would be rooted in knowledge. And rooted in discernment. Discernment meaning what? A practicable wisdom. Discernment means that you you, you discern God's wisdom. That's what discernment means. Discernment has to do with um, practical wisdom, like practically being able to perceive this is of God, this is not. This is a good choice, this is not. This is someone I should spend time with, this is not. This is somewhere I should go, this is not. That's discernment, right? How do you get that kind of wisdom being drilled into Christ, right? That comes from the Spirit. That's being Spirit-led. So what he's saying to them is, he's praying that their love is going to continue to grow, but it's a love that is grounded and rooted in knowledge. Presumably, not, knowledge, not that they're going to get better at French, right? But knowledge of the Lord. And what? And discernment. That they're going to be also growing in their wisdom, and, and a practicable wisdom, so that you may approve what is excellent. So that the things that you say yes to are things that are what? Excellent. That's a prayer. Isn't that a prayer we can give to one another and to people that we love? Praying that they will what? My prayer is that our kids and our grandkids, our nieces and nephews, that their love would abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that they would approve what is excellent. Man. I mean, I got a high school junior. I mean, it's not it's so much longer until he's going to be gone. What do I want? I want this for him, right? For him to grow in his love, but for that love, not just to be sentimental, but to be deeply rooted in knowledge and discernment, for him to make great choices, what? That are excellent, right? Man, that's what we want for anybody. This is Paul's prayer for them. I mean, just he just lo he loves them like they're his babies. Just beautiful. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. 
So that at the end of the day, when they do face the judgment of God, they can what? They can have their heads up high. They're not going to be embarrassed. They're not going to be filled with regret. Because they're going to still pass into glory. They're still going to heaven. But in that moment, it wouldn't be like, man, this is a, you know, let's, let's go for it so you get the well done, good and faithful servant speech from God. Not the, okay, come on in, kid. But no, well done, good and faithful. That's what you want, right? That's what he's saying for them. He's like, that's my prayer for you, is that, that's, that you're going to continue on the path that you're on. That you're going to grow in your love, that it's going to be rooted in knowledge and in discernment. You're going to make great choices, excellent choices. You will approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless because you're not going to make dumb choices that are going to put a blemish on your purity. That are going to, man, be regrets that you have when you face what the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Just what a great prayer. So there's a couple of places where you see something like this. I put these words in your notes here. The word that he uses here for love is this word agape. The love that he hopes for them is that they'll have the love of Christ. Agape love, remember, is selfless love. It's sacrificial love. The word that's used here for knowledge is this word epignosis. Epignosis is a full or innate knowing that comes from experience or a close relationship. It's, just, it's not just a, a, a superficial information. It's just a deep knowing about something. It's an expertise. In something. It's probably that they would basically grow into an expertise about the things of God. And then the other word that's used here is this word aesthesis for discernment. It's moral understanding that's based on experience. Again, it just, it's just deep wisdom. It's, an, it's a wisdom that has to do with moral choices that they would make. So that they would discern what is best and be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. And then this last word, and be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. This expression about being filled with the fruit of righteousness, that's Old Testament. So that expression, you can find that expression in Amos chapter 6, Proverbs 3, Proverbs 11, 3, not 300. It refers, it, the fruit of righteousness refers to, refers to the righteous behavior of a righteous person. It's more just a sense that you can... Be who you are, right? It's like be your best self is something we hear now sometimes in the culture. That you be your best self. And for them, your best self is what? The best Christian that's in you. That's who you are. So it's like be that. And my prayer is that you're going to be that through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Not so that, you know, you know, you look better or you get ahead or things go well in your life. No. The motivation is what? To the glory and praise of God. So that God is glorified by how you live. So that you bear the fragrance of Christ, the aroma of Christ. So you're a credit to the Lord. So that other people will see you and think, man, I want what she's got. You know, I'm struggling with life. I'm, you know, having difficulty with X, Y, and Z. Man, what is she doing right? Because I want that. that that's what it means to sort of carry that into the world in a beautiful way that... that um, that gives glory and praise to God. It's a great, I mean, this is Philippians, right? It's just this encouraging word to a church. It's not a church that's perfect. And it's a church that's being attacked. It's in a tough place. It's in a difficult town. They're a long ways away from anybody else. I mean, it's, it's very much an autonomous church, and yet they have their ducks in a row, as we would say. I mean, they're, they're, they're walking with Christ faithfully. They're getting encouraged. But the reason that they're getting encouraged is because they're facing some headwinds. Because they're having a tough time. And we're going to learn more about that tough time over the coming weeks. But things are not easy for the church in Philippi. Things are difficult. And I think, is this a good time to read a letter to a church that's facing difficult circumstances, but working hard to stay on track with Jesus? I think it is. I think it is. The Lord be with you. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this encouraging word to the church in Philippi. We pray that we would receive it uh, as an inspired word for us. And that we would be motivated, Lord, to seek to double down 
on our pursuit of being the righteous women and men that you've called us to be, on living lives that are rooted in love, love that's informed by knowledge and wisdom, and that all that we do and say would, would bring you honor and glory and praise. We pray your blessing, Lord, upon these women and those whom they love. We pray, Lord, that you continue to protect them and shepherd them and bless them and anoint them. We pray for those among us, Lord, and those that we know who are having a tough time. Pray, Lord, that you would continue to shepherd us through these difficult days and pour out your blessing upon ourselves and our community. We pray these things gratefully in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. God bless you all.